So I am really excited to have an interview with the amazing Ron Schneider. I am so excited today because I got the chance to interview Ron Schneider. You may know him as the uh, original Dreamfinder character at Epcot, walking around the park. Not the one on the ride, but the one that you got to meet. Ron has done a number of amazing things from the Golden Horseshoe with Wally Bogue, all the way up to Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor, and even more. He's got an amazing book, but he's also got a ton of stories and a ton of information and insight. And I'm really excited to present the interview with you. This is part one. There's so much I had to split it up into two parts. So you'll see part two coming up later this week. But uh, let's just jump into it. So very excited to have you with me. Um, you've been all sorts of things in all sorts of different parts from Disney to Magic Mountain to Universal to um, you know a number of di other different things. So uh, easiest place to start, what Start up your interest in theme parks and, and Disney in particular, but just the whole entertainment field. I was interested in performing ever since I was a child. Uh, I grew up in the 50s when my best friends were television kid show hosts mm -hmm. because they were live show hosts on every channel after school. And they got me interested in puppetry and magic and ventriloquism and performing. And I started doing plays when I was a child and uh, up through junior high and high school. And I'd been going to Disneyland all my life. It had been a, a big thing for me. Um, in uh, 1966, when Walt Disney passed, it struck me what a tremendous influence he'd had on my life. Mm -hmm. And um, about 1970, I saw Wally Bogue at the Golden Horseshoe Review, mm -hmm. which was the only live show in the park that wasn't pre-recorded or just a musical group. Yeah. And I took one look at what this man was doing on stage, cutting up and being funny and doing five shows a day. And I said, I want to do that. I want to be that guy. So uh, I started reading up everything I could find on Disneyland's history. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot. Not, not like now. Yeah, not like now. Um, there's, yeah, there's, you can, you can hear any show recording you want, find any narration you want. But back then there was none of that. I had to go to Disneyland with a tape recorder in my hand and film everything and, and learn all the ride scripts like that, but that way. Um, but there was this big technological revolution going on in the 60s with all the new, the new rides and the Tiki Room and Pirates of the Caribbean. But there was nothing in the way of live performance that... Uh, affected me and that made me want to see that explored. And so I just, I determined that this was going to be a course of study for me. I knew I wanted to be a performer, but it just slowly came upon me that I wanted to be a performer uh, at Disneyland in a theme park. That's what interested me. Um, so uh, this is in 1970, uh, just so happened that I turned 18 and I was old enough to get a job. So I got a job at Disneyland uh, in a circus tent, working behind the park, handing out Christmas parade costumes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the following summer, Magic Mountain opened uh, north of Los Angeles. And I was a ride operator at Magic Mountain. And, and from that point ride, on... Which what, ride did you work on? I was on the Grand Prix. Okay. Our, our version of the Autopia. Autopia. Yep. As a matter of fact, the uh, car, truck came by and dropped off our cars for Magic Mountain. And in the back of the truck were the cars that were going to Florida for the um, Grand Prix at uh, Walt Disney World. Okay. Same company, Aero Company. So um, uh, I just determined that I was going to take every step I could that was going to take me towards the Golden Horseshoe. And so throughout the 70s, I worked at Universal Studios as a tour guide, mm -hmm. and I worked at uh, various themed restaurants around Southern California. I went to college. Um, I worked on my uh, traveling salesman skills because mm -hmm. I was in love with Harold Hill from The Music Man. Well, <laughs> Wally Bogue was a traveling salesman in uh, The Golden Horseshoe, and I put together a medicine pitch. Uh, I was a big fan of W.C. Field, so I studied him. I studied his work. And um, so throughout the 70s, I was building up uh, my repertoire, my knowledge about theme parks and worked at Magic Mountain, not only as a ride operator in 70, uh, 71, 
But um, at 72, I was in, worked on their children's animal farm with wild animals. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 77, I got a job there as a traveling salesman, doing my medicine pitch on the streets at Spillican Corners. And uh, 1980 came along after 10 years, and Disneyland was casting the Golden Horseshoe Review for the uh, 25th anniversary of the park. They were looking for someone to do the shows at night while Wally did them mm -hmm. during the day. I walked in and got the job. Mm. Uh, the head of talent booking was sitting at the table with Wally when I auditioned. And as I walked up, he turned to Wally Bogue and said, this is the kid I told you about. Um, I always told people, I say, if you want to get someplace, stay where you are and do the best job you can. Yep. And that's what happened to me. Um, so that, that's how I got started, got, how I got interested in it. Uh, I determined that this is going to be my study. This is going to be my life, this particular kind of work. The idea that um, I perform in a theme park, I perform one on one with the guest mm -hmm. to the guest and that the star of what I do is the guest, yep. their reaction, their emotional, intellectual, spiritual, physical uh, experience is my product. Mm -hmm. I do a two person act. The other person just doesn't know their lines. Yep. So I have to trick <laughs> them. I have to trick them into playing with me and participating in what I'm doing. Uh, this, is, this is what has fascinated me through 40 years. And um, so throughout my life, I took all these jobs that would move me towards greater knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. Never held a job more than six years uh, because you get in some place and you have all sorts of things to learn. And then what inevitably happens is management changes and the opportunities <laughs> start to fall away and it's time to go someplace else. Yep. And uh, so that's the long answer to your question. It, it, it's interesting hearing the parallels because um, I worked as a Rhino Rally driver at Bush Gardens in Florida, which we joked was Jungle Cruise on wheels. Mm -hmm. And we performed for everybody in the Land Rover. Um, as the photographer on Main Street, we performed for the guests that we were taking the pictures of. Mm -hmm. um, and then at Silver Dollar City in Branson, I was a train robber and conductor. And the mm -hmm. same thing. And, and yes, one of the keys is you find that person or a couple people in the audience, and they're the ones you focus on you're the one I'm, I'm targeting and I'm performing for. And when you get them involved in interacting, it changes your whole performance. Mm -hmm. If you got, you know, the dead group, okay, let me find somebody else then to, you know, work with. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's kind of neat to, to hear the parallels there. But at the same time, you, you did so much more. Uh, before we ran into technical issues, you mentioned something that I wanted to follow up on. You said that you just found out recently that you're high-functioning autistic. So um, I have a niece who's high top that's autistic. Um, I've got a couple cousins that are on my wife's side. My daughter, uh, we believe, is high functioning autistic. We're still finishing the diagnosis, so we've got a lot of that in the family. Um, I'm curious when you found out the diagnosis, if you're willing to share, how do you think that's affected you over the years? Um, wonderful question. Um, the only reason I found that out is that I became engaged to a woman who works with autistic children. Mm -hmm. She has a son who's high functioning autistic. And, um, and, and suddenly I was exposed to all this. Uh, I never knew it was never mm -hmm. diagnosed. Um, I have, uh, my, I have a sister, uh, who has a son who is, um, nonverbal learning disorder. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the first I ever start to, started to hear about anything on the spectrum. Right. And in talking to her about him, I realized that's a lot of the same stuff I went through as a child. Um, and looking back now, I realized something that over those 40 years, all of my successes were working alone. Mm. I had these jobs where I was a unique performer. Um, and did not really collaborate too well with a general uh, team. Mm -hmm. I was, um, when I was, I was on the crew at Magic Mountain, then I did my medicine show. We had a, we had a whole crew called the Rainbow Circus. Mm -hmm. And I did my medicine show, but I did my medicine show. Every, no one else did my medicine show. I did my medicine show. And no one else influenced what I did. They helped me. My boss was terrific with me and they gave me advice and stuff like that. But when I went out there, did my show, I was by myself. Golden Horseshoe, the comic does the comics act. 
Nobody else does the comics act at that performance. When I was at Monsters Laugh Floor, um, that was the closest I came to working with a team and that I had to work with another per person, but the other person was in a separate booth. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, what other examples? Uh, in, I worked at Titanic Experience for six years. It was a wonderful show, wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. I was my own tour guide. I had my own control of tour, wrote, directed my tour. When I worked at restaurants, I worked at a lot of themed restaurants. I, I opened mm -hmm. six themed restaurants. I never waited tables. Mm -hmm. Always seated. Hit them, get the bit, walk away. Yeah. So I was never tied down to working with a group like that. Uh, one of the highest compliments I was ever paid by a friend of mine who I've worked with on a lot of projects. He said to me, Ron, working with you is, 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 is worth it. It was a very high, very high praise. Mm -hmm. that what he got out of me was worth the agony of working with me. Um, and uh, so the, only in retrospect do I look at it all and I go, yeah, I always, I always worked uh, alone. Mm -hmm. in, collab in a collaborative medium. It's a very collaborative medium, as you know, but I always worked alone. Um, and, uh, and you were alone in that, uh, in that vehicle. You were mm -hmm. alone as a photo, as a photo guy, um, as much as you, but as you had people we working with you, but, but the thing about what we do is we create a magic moment between people, between mm -hmm. ourselves and the other people, and then it ends. Right. And what we do is very, mechanized in mm -hmm. that respect. Um, my specialty is not improv. I do not do improv. Well. Right. Um, I work in a corporate themed environment mm -hmm. uh, in that I, I wedge what I do into a highly structured environment and I deal creatively within that environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I never worked a Renaissance fair. I've always wanted to, but I don't have those tools. I don't have the, those chops, um, but put me in a Disney park. Mm -hmm. where there's only four or five ways people can respond to a wizard holding a dragon. Right. Once I know what those four or five ways are, I can prepare four or five separate answers for those different ways. Mm -hmm. and boom, I got my 30 minutes of material. Yeah. And I go out there and our, our greatest skill, yours and mine, is to make this stuff look like it never happened before. Mm -hmm. Every guest we work for realizes, feels that what's happened with them is unique to them and is completely fresh and magic, but, but it really isn't. Yeah. And what we're doing is, is very tough to do and, and a tremendous challenge. The miracle of the first time <laughs> is our product. And we go out there and we, in, in this structured environment, this plastic environment where people have paid $150 to park their damn cars. We have to come in and create a magic thing that it never fails. Mm -hmm. What I specialize in is not um, uh, constant perfection. It's not, it's not constant innovation. It's consistent perfection. Mm -hmm. And um, that is really the product you have to have in a theme park. Because with what the guests are paying at the gate, you can't afford to give them a mediocre job. Right. You've got to create a magic moment for them every moment. Yeah. In fact, I, I just recently posted a video. Uh, talking about that where really what you think is impromptu at a theme park mm -hmm. really isn't it's mm -hmm. scripted it's practiced um you know you kind of have an idea of what's coming from the guests and for each one of those things you have like a half dozen canned lines mm -hmm. that are ready to go depending mm -hmm. upon the situation mm -hmm. and yeah they think everything is fresh and new because they've never seen it and that's kind of the key is to make sure that it looks fresh and new even if you've said it a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand times. The problem is when you get to mass producing that in mm -hmm. a theme park, it's easy for the parks, the parks standards, uh, which comes from management, right, to settle for. In my book, I talk about the word "cute." Mm -hmm. We put stuff out there that's cute, but it doesn't fool anybody. Right. It doesn't make any people. It doesn't make people laugh with there's a fine line in creating this stuff keeping it fresh but keeping it um effective mm -hmm. breaking through the plastic um that uh comes wrapped around every disney show yeah. and um and making it feel real to the guest um for a moment mm -hmm. um you know disney relies a lot on puns and cute nomenclatures nothing wrong with that 
but um, for an adult, see, here's the thing. We're supposed to be entertaining people of all ages. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easy to fool a kid, you'd think. (laughs) <laughs> but um, we're also supposed to be entertaining adults who see through this stuff. You have to be a little more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. You've got to be a little more sensitive and you got to, you got to work harder to fool an adult. It can be done. Mm-hmm. You can draw out the child in an adult, which is what Walt was wanted us to do, but um, you can't do it with the same notes that you do with a child. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the good examples I use is when uh, a parent uh, when, when an adult meets Dreamfinder and Figment, I would not push Figment forward. Figment would lay back, mm-hmm. and he would look at the look at the adult, look at me, look at the adult, and I would never talk about it. I'd ignore him. Yep. Then finally, the adult has to say, "What is that?" And I'd say, "You see him too." <laughs> Boom! They're playing my game. They're yep. stuck playing my game, and um, I've drawn I've drawn them in in spite of themselves, and. Uh, that is the challenge we have to we have to give this challenge to ourselves because no one else is going to give it to us uh the, the you know it, it a lot of it depends on where on the philosophy of management and where they come from at at universal working for jay stein who was a ruthless fellow who if it didn't amaze him and scare him and thrill him mm-hmm. would not approve it um whereas uh i had an imagineer say to me as long as it's cute, no one will complain. Oh. And oh. Um, and it's that's true, but the people who aren't complaining are also management. Right. So. And it, it, management has such a huge role because in all, all of those positions, there were times we had great managers and you just thrived. Everybody thrived on it. And then you get the manager that just didn't quite get it. And it just... It, it would kill everybody's performance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it, it was always easier for me when you actually had a manager that had come up through it, come whether directly with what we were doing or in a related field, and they would understand what it meant to actually perform. Um, too many don't. <laughs> yeah, there's that. And um, also there's the, beware of the person who wants to be Walt Disney. Yes. And lacks those chops. Um, and everybody in the theme park wants to be Walt Disney when it comes right <laughs> down to it. That's why we work. Why else work there? Unless you or unless you want to make magic. Doesn't pay that well. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you got to get a charge out of it uh, in one respect or another. And um, so it, it's, if you work with somebody like that who, who thinks they have that skill, and um, and you and you need to watch out for them sometimes because they they will they'll do you in and you know they, these people will do anything to keep the job. Yeah, you say it becomes their priority sometimes. So, um, got a couple of questions here from some of my viewers I wanted to throw out. Um, yes, and make sure that I got it. Um, is there anything you learned from Wally Bogue that stuck with you throughout your career? Um. Well, watching him, first of all, just mm-hmm. watching him, the fact that he did that same show five times a day, and it always looked like it never happened, it never happened before. Um, there was that. Uh, when I met him backstage, he was pretty much all business. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd been in the business forever by that time. Um, uh, but so he didn't have he didn't have much to teach me from that aspect from backstage. I'd already been doing the medicine pitch at that time for uh, five years. Mm -hmm. I'd been studying his work for 10 years. Um, So uh, he didn't, uh, he, he, he taught me that if you're practicing uh, juggling guns, stand over a bed because you're going to drop the gun a lot. You won't have to bend over so far to pick it up. (laughs) Um. So no, I didn't learn that much from uh, from Wally personally. I learned I learned all of it from watching him. Okay, he would come into the he would come into the saloon, make his entrance, and he would look as surprised as we were that he was there. And um, he just always kept it fresh. Every mm. show, it was fresh. Um, he would throw little things into the show that kept it fresh for him and Fulton. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he went through a phase uh, where he kept looking down at his wedding ring and going, 
just like that. Like he couldn't believe that he was married. Um, he, he never commented on it. Mm -hmm. but there was a couple of years where he would do that a lot. So there was something going on. We didn't know what it was. Um, but uh, the, there were little things that he would throw into the show. And I would throw little things into the show sometimes too that would break Fulton up. Uh, sometimes I put my foot in my mouth, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a terrible thing to do at Disneyland. But um, I, I learned from him that um, th to keep it alive for them, but also keep it alive for me. Uh, helps keep your sanity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and also it opens you up to trying different things. Mm -hmm. um, I walked, <laughs> I, I had a little baby girl when I was um, uh, doing the horseshoe and she had a duck puppet, mm -hmm. a little hand duck puppet that I used to entertain her with. Uh, so one day I took the duck puppet to the golden horseshoe and I tucked it in the back of the curtain. And um, I finished the medicine pitch. I finished working with the kid. I went over. Nobody knew I was going to do this. I grabbed the duck puppet. I put it on my hand. And I went, hey, gang, look who's here. It's Ricky the duck. Everybody shout, hi, Ricky. And the whole audience went, hi, Ricky. And I said, well, that's enough of that. I threw him in the orchestra. <laughs> Died. Everybody just died, <laughs> and uh, put them in the show. As was that was in the show from that day forward. <laughs> um, uh, and the the band would pick the duck up and do horrible things to him while I was on stage finishing the bit. Um, <laughs> uh, never being afraid to try try new things. And at the horseshoe, I could get away with it because I was my own franchise. See. Um, I learned more from Fulton, I think, from, than from Wally. Uh, Fulton Burley, uh, on stage, he was this hail fellow, well met, joking all the time, every, same exact guy off stage. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. A million jokes, a million cracks, and always up, always positive and stuff like that. Wally, Fulton used to drive me to work. Uh, he, we both mm. lived in the San Fernando Valley, and he would drive me. Uh, at the Dis into Disneyland when I was going to do the show. And um, it's just fascinating, wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, I loved him dearly. I love them all dearly. Um, um, they, they, I mean, you remember they, they, were do they had been doing that show for 15 years by the time I came on board. I know, oh, by the time I came on board, they been doing it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was a, it was a job to them, but you couldn't tell from the front of the house. Right. You couldn't tell from the front of the house, boy. That show was 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 a, was a diamond, and um, they replaced it with a show that was written and scripted and directed by Disney, and um, yeah. lacked lacked all the charm and all the wit. Uh, it was a lot a lot of great dancing. I the the first time I got to see it would have been about 1980, and um, mm -hmm. I, I believe it was still the original show. Yeah, of course, I was ten years old at the time. Well, that, uh, that was out here, right? Oh uh, yeah, it was Florida. Yeah, or Disneyland. Disneyland. Since 1980, it might yeah. have seen me. Uh, it's possible. It was like I said. I was 10 years old at the time, and my biggest memory of it, um, I remember the dancing. I remember it being funny and entertaining. And then you know, the 10 year old kid in me, one of the girls, so she was running through the audience, tapped me on the head and said hi, and I was just like. <gasps> <laughs> Do you, um, were you there for the 25th anniversary by any chance? Um, I believe so. I remember I was there in 80 and 84 um, after the Olympics. And um, I remember a big giveaway where they were giving away a car a day. And I think that was the 25th. No, no. 25th. There was no car on the 25th. Okay. The car came. The car came in the years that followed when they would do an anniversary. Okay. But there was no, there was no car given away on the 25th. No. Um, I did the show the evening of the 25th anniversary. Oh, really? Uh, okay. July, July 17th, 1980. Um, mm. I think, I think I Jim did. Adams did the show during the day, and I did the five shows at night. Okay. Uh, the, the 25th anniversary was an amazing experience because Disney had not done a major anniversary at the park yet. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what they had. And the park was not jam-packed, mm. nicely full. Park was open 24 hours, actually. It was Park was open something like um, 
uh, 40 hours, I think, because from the oh, day goodness. before it opened uh, the morning of the 16th and then stayed open through the night of the 17th. Okay. And um, the park was just nicely full. Yeah. And the people who were there were the people who would not have imagined, who would not have dreamed of being anywhere else mm -hmm. on that day. So uh, when midnight came around and the start of the birthday, Main Street was just full of people sitting on the street, sitting in the street on mm -hmm. the floor. And um, the park was just, it was charming. It was so wonderful and mellow. Every ride you got on, there were people who were there for the same reason really? you were, because they loved the park and what it had meant to them, not what it, uh, throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. We had breakfast uh, overlooking Tom Sawyer's Island at uh, the Pancake House as the sun came up over Tom Sawyer's mm. Oh, my God. And then to go do the horseshoe show that night. Mm -hmm. I kept running into, everywhere I went, I kept running into crowds of people who would, were friends of mine because they, they knew that they would run into me because of, yep. of, of what a fan I was of the park. Um, yeah, there was never anything like the 25th anniversary again. Mm. That It always got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That that's neat. Yeah, I, I don't remember when we went, and we lived up in Sacramento, so it was an eight-hour drive. So we only mm -hmm. went. Well, I said, I think <clears> I went a total of three times before I became before I got to high school, and then did the grad trip. So it was an unusual thing. So I'm sure it wasn't the anniversary, but working at Walt Disney World, I can remember in particular like the not so scary parties and stuff, where you would get a little bit of that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. but probably not anywhere near on the same level no um yeah that that would have been a, a neat neat event but my family okay theme parks are part of the vacation but we did everything else and uh my dad still kind of looks at me like what's wrong with you that you're so fascinated with them mm -hmm. like well <laughs> it's, it's nice to have something fun to, mm -hmm. to forget the mess that is reality and and step out of it a lot of times so uh hearing you talk about the 25th that would have been amazing that would have been amazing um let me see let me kind of get a couple of others um so you helped create the dream finder character that's what a lot of us remember you as what was it like to create this character to walk around in the parks well, Dreamfinder, of course, had been created for the ride already. When, mm -hmm. I was, when I was brought on, they were just finishing up the programming on the ride. And so um, I saw uh, Tony Baxter talking about Dreamfinder at Disneyland um, in 1982. And um, he held up a picture of the characters and said, these mm -hmm. are going to be the only Disney characters at Epcot. And it was exactly the same experience I had when I saw Wally Bogue mm -hmm. the first time. I said, that's me. I want to do that. So by that time, I had 12 years in uh, experience in theme parks, 10, uh, five of them, two of the uh, Golden Horseshoe. So I went to Sonny Anderson, who was head of talent booking, and said, are you going to have this character walking around? And he said, yeah. And I said, I want to do the job. And he and the fellow who was in charge of Epcot Entertainment, who had been an old friend of mine, uh, said, OK, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no one had ever done it before. Um, I sat down with Tony again. And he and Barry Braverman spilled their guts about everything they had about uh, Dreamfinder's character, huh. um, where he came from, what inspired him, what he was supposed to represent, the relationship between him and Figment. Um, and that was all I had to go on, as well as my own experience creating theme park characters, mm -hmm. creating the character I did for Magic Mountain and Universal Studios and like this. So... Um, it was like taking on any other role. I've always, I've always acted. I've always been an actor on, mm -hmm. in addition to what, what else I did for theme parks. And so I'm used to taking in information on paper and extrapolating a three-dimensional character from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the Dream Finder, uh, it was more of a philosophical experience because um, what he really was based on was the, um, the message of Epcot. Mm -hmm. Uh, the idea that um, in, in a case of our ride, imagination is something that belongs to everyone. 
that's the theme of the of the of the ride. And uh, since all of Epcot is the product of imagination, all of World Showcase is a product of human imagination. My my spine had to be. Uh, inspiring people to recognize the imagination in themselves and to recognize themselves as imaginative uh, beings mm -hmm. and to, like I said, trick them into playing with me imaginatively. So um, I started uh, flailing around uh, looking for uh, connections in that respect. I found a book called Creative Dramati uh, Dramatics mm -hmm. um, about um, doing improv games with children. Um, I found a, uh, a, uh, a line of merchandise called Pocket Dragons. This wonderful artist had created dozens of little green dragons. And there was a line of greeting cards that showed this old white bearded wizard who lived with all these little dragons, getting all over everything, tearing up his office and crawling on him when he's asleep. And I bought a whole bunch of these cards and put them up on the wall in my dressing room because this is what, uh, this is what I thought Dreamfinder's life would be like. Um, as soon as I could get my hands on the, on the puppet, I started playing with the puppet and um, trying to figure out how I was going to make him look like he wasn't, wasn't part of me, mm -hmm. like there are two minds at work. And uh, so all of this work um, done in a vacuum, because uh, we hadn't opened yet. Mm -hmm. there, was no, there was no audience yet. Um, for example, I bought myself one of those hand grip things that exercise mm -hmm. your hand, thinking that I would need to build up the strength in my hand so that I could close it strongly. No, no, no. With Figment, you had to open your hand strongly. That was, ex oh. it was exactly the opposite. opposite. The, puppet, the puppet was so poorly made that it was sculpted with its mouth closed and or almost closed. And so you had to force it open, open, which of course, since the back of the mouth was sculpted in a curve, would split the rubber and would look awful after a while. Um, but, and there was nobody else on this project. I was the only guy doing this at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're opening a theme park, as you probably know, nothing's ready. <laughs> You open the park and it's um, everybody's eating out of trailers mm -hmm. and there's no dressing room for the dream finder. There's no break room for the dream finder. You, uh, it takes, uh, usually it takes a year before everything's in place to do the job right. In the case of dream finder, it was over two years before Ooh. we had the wig, beard and mustache. The fake arm for the puppet was right. Mm -hmm. um, all of this. Mm. And uh, so this is all, and, and by the way, gang, it's all detailed in my fabulous book. Yes. Um, they, they, yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so that's what I was working with. Uh, and, and, and playing with the guests, developing the material and discovering what the game was going to be for me to play with. I didn't want to go out there and just pose for pictures and sign autographs. Yeah. You know, autograph, autograph books are the worst thing that ever happened to characters <laughs> because autograph books become, we got to check this mark. We got to check, mark, check, mark this off and now go on to the next thing. You got to take a picture, check the thing. And, and guests, that's all they know. That's yeah. all they think you're there for. In order to get them to play with me and get the message I wanted to put out there, I had to find ways to get past that. And um, so that was the constant challenge for me. And uh, uh, it was quite an adventure. The first couple, uh, first couple days were, were not a lot of fun, but um, it quickly turned around. It, it was interesting. Uh, while I was working for PhotoPass, they created this system they called PASS. And it was presentation activity signature uh, snapshot. Mm -hmm. And basically they scripted the whole encounter and it was, it was something that when you could break out of that mold, that's when the special encounters happened. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Trust me, I absolutely did. This is just amazing for me. I want to give a huge thank you to Ron for joining me for this. Part two will be coming up later on this week, so look for that. I also want to give a huge shout out to Emma over at the Talking Mickey Project 
who also interviewed Ron and helped give me the connections to make this possible. So thank you, Emma. Thank you as well to everybody who likes, shares, and subscribes. Don't forget to do that. And to my financial partners, both on YouTube members and Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. There's a lot more information in the links, including to Ron's channel. You can check that out. And be sure to check part two coming up later this week. Thank you so much for watching. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to know about contact information, fan pages, merchandise, and more, please be sure to check the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to know when I have new ones, well, make sure you hit that subscribe button right up there. And if you want to see another one of my videos, well, I've got a great one for you right here. And a huge thank you to these wonderful people here who support me on Patreon and with YouTube memberships. They get behind the scenes information, special perks, and more. If you'd like to know more about that, well, make sure you check that button right there. Thank you so much.